Hello, welcome everyone to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today we discuss the recent summit of the two most powerful men in the world, President Biden and President Xi. This happened last week, precisely 16th of November, and they spoke for 3.5 hours. But of course, the interpretation was not simultaneous. So the interpreters took half the time. But still, they must have spoken for two hours and the atmosphere was reasonably good. What were the concerns of these two leaders when they decided to meet? It appears that it was President Biden who suggested it. And that too, just a few days after, President Xi was declared equivalent to Mao Zedong in Chinese history. Not only that, the possibility for his becoming president for life was made clear. And he was called the helmsman and the core leader of the Communist Party of China. So President Xi was at the height of his glory, while President Biden, on the other hand, had his rating very low. But the White House spokesperson said, that President Biden was going to talk to President Xi um, from a position of strength because he was building up his alliances in the last few months. So he was, according to the White House, he was feeling good about the kind of alliances that he had gathered in the last few months and he was ready to meet the helmsman of China. So what is it that was achieved? In my view, the two points are very clear. China is seeking to be equal to the United States. It seems to have given up for the time being, winning over the United States was overtaking it. Because repeatedly, President Xi spoke about equality between the two superpowers. The second, they both seem to suggest that they both could control international affairs in the future. They kept saying that if we agree, we work together, we can uh, make sure that the international situation remains stable. So in other words, a kind of G2, group of two, you know, we have what about group of 77, group of 20, group of five, etc. Here, the emergence of a group of two, in other words, they are saying that they are the big powers, and it is their relationship which is going to keep a balance in the, in the world. So these were the main trends that I saw in it more than anything else. And also, one could say that what they settled was not for cold war, but for cold peace. Because both of them said that we don't want a cold war, but it was obvious that they were not going to have peace peace itself, but some kind of an uncomfortable peace, but neither of them was wanting to go to war. Uh, China, of course, we, we don't have any full account of what they talk to each other, but we have only tidbits from various uh, conversations, various reports, various articles, etc. Et so a couple of quotes have come out from all this. President Xi is supposed to have said to uh, President Biden that China and the US should respect each other, coexist in peace, pursue win-win cooperation, and manage domestic affairs well while shouldering international responsibilities. So there is not suggesting any kind of conflict, but cooperation, common responsibilities, and respect each other. President Biden, on the other hand, talked about our responsibility as leaders of China and the US. Again, more or less the same sentiment, that the competition between our two countries should not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended. Just simple, straightforward competition. And he asked for what he called guard rails, so that any competition does not uh, descend into any kind of conflict. Uh, 
another uh, another point which came out was that President Xi questioned the uh, the claim of the United States heading the democratic movements of the world. He questioned the ideology of democracy itself and explained that democracy is not mass produced with, with a uniform model. So he said that democracy, no country can claim a patent for democracy. In other words, President Xi believes that his own rights has happened because of the will of the people and is as much a democracy as anybody else. So these are the, some fundamental points which have come out from various um, statements and various quotes which we have received from the conference. Uh, but the main theme of the uh, conference, or both sides were trying out the each other's position on Taiwan. Because recently, a United States team of lawmakers visited Taiwan to discuss supply of new advanced arms and ammunition to Taiwan. But the problem is that the United States believes in one China policy, like we do. In other words, Taiwan is theoretically part of China. But at the same time, the United States says that Taiwan has the right to protect itself and it will not allow the situation of two units of China remaining as they are. No change should be brought about by unilateral action by China. So it was very clear from China's probing President Biden, he got the impression that if China were to attack Taiwan, as some people believe it might, there would be definitely a reaction from the US. And that message, he got it clear, but at the same time, they did not go further into that. And that's why I said it as kind of cold peace. Both understood the dangers of confrontation. Both understood the uh, value of maintaining the status quo as far as Taiwan and China are concerned. And therefore, they measured each other and decided that there was nothing to be done at the moment. But uh, China made it very clear that it has now become a second most power from the country. And uh, China expects that um, the United States uh, will understand it and realize it. Of course, both of them agreed that there should be economic uh, competition rather than trade wars. Cold war or trade war would be detrimental to both, which of course is good news for the rest of the world because neither of them is thinking of war at this point. Uh, President Biden has a record of not having created any crisis or conflicts in the last 10 months that we have, he has been president of the United States. And therefore, even, even in the case of North Korea, he has not taken an aggressive position. So on the whole, he has taken a peaceful phase. And even when he talks about a difference of opinion with China, he doesn't think that, that there will be any kind of uh, conflict. President Xi also wanted to cooperate with the US if it did not interfere in its internal uh, affairs. Uh, President Biden is supposed to have raised the question of uh, human rights in Hong Kong, which is now part of China, and also in Xinjiang province, which is within China. And uh, President Xi naturally uh, opposed such ideas, and he said it was a kind of uh, interference in the domestic affairs and it will not be accepted. So there again, neither of them came to any understanding, but they understood each other very well. But what President Biden understood very clearly was Taiwan president, the President Xi's statement that any interference with Taiwan will be playing with fire. These were the exact words he used. So he gave a very strong warning to the United States not to intervene in uh, Taiwan under any pre pretext. So uh, both sides have been very uh, sensible, one can say, that uh, this exchange uh, did not result in any aggravation of the situation. 
In fact, one report that came out was that after the summit, the shares of arms manufacturers in um, the United States and China went down. In other words, people began calculating that there would be no war and therefore people were not willing to invest more in arms manufacturing. That's a good sign. Even a cold peace creates some kind of a good feeling. So, uh, on the one hand, President uh, Biden had strengthened his alliances, Quad is there, AUKUS is there. So, he spoke from a feeling of strength and warning to China that he was now fully prepared to meet any challenge. At the same time, he did not want to go into that. So, equality is that they speak, spoke about. And uh, it is the idea of both of them keeping the peace and keeping the balance in international affairs by their behavior. So they accepted that responsibility, not because anybody is asking them to do so, but between them. And the world, of course, is looking at it with some second sense of realism because there is no third country which, is, which wants to interfere in these affairs. So as the world's largest economies and permanent members of the Security Council of the UN, China and the United States should build, cooperate through better communication, is what President Xi asked for. Better communication, that is what President Xi wanted. And the guardrails, which is uh, President Biden wanted. And both these are uh, fairly uh, reasonable. And a sound and steady US-China relationship needed for safeguarding peaceful and stable international environment. So even though on the question of Taiwan, there were some strong exchanges of words perhaps, and also on uh, domestic affairs, human rights, etc., there were also strong words, but both of them did not indicate there was going to be a worsening of the relationship between the two countries. So China sees Taiwan as a breakaway province to be reunited with the mainland and on the United States, on the other hand, as a one China policy and therefore uh, cannot claim that Taiwan should be allowed to be independent. So reunification is a desire of all Chinese, according to uh, President Xi. Uh, but this did not uh, descend into a kind of arguments. I don't know what kind of words they used, but uh, what came out of it was a kind of reasonable acceptance of each other's position. Uh, on trade matters, there are very serious issues, but they don't seem to have discussed trade because President Biden had said recently that he was not looking for trade agreements and arrangements for a little time. So maybe they did not discuss it, but apparently President Biden talked about the promise the Chinese had made about importing more American goods, because there is a big trade imbalance between China and the United States. Um, but uh, Xi did not protest that. She did not say that we will not import. But at the same time, he warned that um, using uh, the excuse of national security, Chinese companies should, be, should not be oppressed. He was probably referring to the arrest of the Huawei um, leader's uh, daughter who was arrested and kept in Canadian jails for several months. So he considered that as a kind of national security being used in order to suppress uh, Chinese companies. And that was also fairly a reasonable uh, request. So whether uh, China will import more Chinese goods it is uh, uh, yet, to be, yet to be seen. So on the whole, this visit was, uh, this uh, conversation was much more reasonable and much more uh, polite than the last meeting of uh, senior officials, including the Secretary of State in Alaska, where the Chinese and the Americans um, were on the, appeared to be on the brink of conflict. They were using strong language against each other. There was no kind of understanding 
of any of the issues. So in that sense, in the last few months, both seem to have stepped back uh, from a uh, conflict. From the brink of a conflict, they seem to have stepped back, understood each other's position, and uh, deciding to cooperate and not confront each other, not to create war situations. But assuming that both of them have become the leaders of the world and they have a heavy responsibility in the, keeping the peace in the world. And for China, the most satisfying thing is that President Biden treated him as an equal. And uh, he apparently made the request for the uh, conversation and not China. So all this indicate that uh, uh, the, what we have, we can expect is, a, is, as I called, a cold peace. Nothing very extraordinary about cooperation, but at the same time, not going to a trade war or a cold war. Of course, we would like to know whether the word India came up in these conversations. We have no indication of that. Did President Biden ask him what President Xi wanted to do in the duck? Maybe not. I don't think they wanted to bring in any other country. But as they say, India was the elephant in the room in a sense, because both of them were very conscious of India's position, how India is now more or less tied up with the United States for its security. And thus that would mean uh, India uh, not being particularly friendly to China, and they would make their demands. And then, therefore, when he spoke, when they spoke about peace, security, war, conflict, etc., etc., I'm sure both of them had in mind the, also the situation of, of India. So from India perspective, India's perspective also, we can feel comfortable that they are not going to launch into any kind of conflict and all of us would be allowed to continue peacefully after the pandemic. Of course, pandemic is a big issue and what kind of trade relationship will be developed between the two countries. And in fact, when the pandemic end are all big questions. But for the time being, the the post-COVID, we can't say post-COVID yet, but as we are tapering into a post-COVID world, the signal that has the signals that have come from United States and China are hopeful. That's all that we can say about this summit. It was a reasonable discussion. They exchanged ideas, they got to know each other better, and they realized also that there was no point in a kind of conflict. But at the same time, they stuck to their positions, particularly on Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang, and so on. So no spectacular successes, but certainly a sense of comfort for the world. Thank you. Well, Russia seems to have given that dominant role, given up that dominant role long ago with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the Chinese leaders keep talk, reminding their people about Russia. They said, we should not make the mistake that Soviet Union made. Because that is something that rings in their ears, because both of them have followed the same kind of route uh, to communism. And uh, suddenly, a superpower, a communist superpower collapse and disappear, collapse and disappears. So the Chinese must have been studying whatever uh, was done in the Soviet Union, and they do speak about it also occasionally as a kind of model that they should not follow. So Russia has no reason to feel offended by the Chinese uh, uh, position. And in fact, uh, President Biden seems to worry more about um, President Putin rather than about uh, President Xi because of the possibility of tension in uh, Europe. There are talks about Russia invading Ukraine and things like that. So that is, and also uh, Russia has been developing its nuclear weapons. Incidentally, China is also expanding its nuclear uh, armaments, some of the reports say. So Russia is not a player anymore in this G2. We cannot aspire to be a G3. And so Russia, will be as comfortable as the rest of us 
in uh, cooperation between these two powers. You're asking me? <laughs> I wish I knew. They did not resolve it themselves. So Soviet Union, so, sorry, uh, United States and China did not resolve it. They cannot resolve it uh, because the fundamental difference, China believes that, uh, in, that is a fact too, China believes that it's a breakaway land from mainland and should be united. But just as they have accepted a separate uh, status for Hong Kong, what they are thinking of would be that final solution would be Taiwan will remain an independent or semi-independent state, but at the same time follow uh, Chinese policies and Chinese international view. That may happen. But at the moment, I think both United States and China will be happier leaving Taiwan alone and not provoke any kind of conflict between them. Taiwan itself has been following a policy of a steady relationship with what they call the mainland. Uh, but uh, basically, they have the intention to be independent sometime or the other. So that cannot be resolved easily. Well, this is an old issue, it is not a uh, present issue or any. I don't think there was any kind of uh, discussion on, on such things. But UN, UNSG, sorry, NSG. Uh, we have a permanent waiver, and therefore there is really no reason for us to, to fight for uh, membership of the NSG. Because I remember I was engaged in those negotiations when the United States informed us that they would welcome India to NSG. Originally, all NSG members were against India entering, but the United States said that they will try to get India into NSG. And in the, that context, they pushed one or two other groups onto us, which were we were not particularly interested, like the Conventional Weapons Convention or the Australia Group on Chemical Weapons, Chemicals, etc. We were not very keen on that. But they promised all these together, four of these groups, including NSG, and then found that the other three went through, while NSG remained because China vetoed it because um, uh, China said that unless you sign the NPT, you cannot be in NSG. They are right in that sense, because NSG is based on NPT. So unless we become a member of the NPT, we cannot be in the NSG. And my personal view is that we need not worry about it, because we have a permanent, unconditional waiver of the NSG conditions. So what we think is that we join NSG, then we'll also be party to the decision-making of the NSG. That may be good, but that is not achievable. Well, it's always been, a, China is always a direct threat to India, there is no question about it, whether they cooperate or not. So, but their cooperating is better for us because uh, there will be an atmosphere of peace rather than war. And uh, if they are in conflict, naturally we'll be drawn into it. So uh, China being a threat to India will remain, whatever be their relationship with the United States is. But if the atmosphere is that of peace, then China will also be perhaps more amenable to settling our border question and becoming friendly with India again. That's a distant future, but um, the Chinese threat to India will not be affected either way by this summit or US-China relationship. Well, uh, our approach will definitely be that uh, the, these two countries should coexist. President, Biden, President Trump's approach was more helpful to us because he was openly supportive of India. And at a very crucial moment in Ladakh, he forced disengagement on China by supporting India to the hilt. He and his Secretary of State were very open. And at that time, Quad was also emerging, not simply as a, uh, uh, as a dialogue, but as a major military alliance. So that was what President Trump was pushing for. And therefore, uh, we got a very good support at that time. And that may be the reason why the Chinese agreed to disengage. But now we know that they are not so agreeable to disengage. 
So that means what suited was President Trump's approach, but we have no quarrel with President Biden's approach either, because if he is uh, proposing coexistence, India would also be very happy as long as there is no interference or there is no aggression. And uh, gradually we can move towards uh, the demarcation of the border. And that is our objective. Demarcate the border and have a peaceful cooperative relationship with China. But how realistic it is, we will see. But that has nothing to do with the um, uh, US position. But the Biden approach has made uh, China less, uh, shall we say, uh, friendly to India. Because um, Chinese position on the border has not changed. We have resumed talks at the commander's level again. Uh, but we haven't heard anything much about this engagement because that is very important for us. And um, therefore, that is what we'll be pursuing. And so if President Trump was there, perhaps China would have been a little more cooperative with India, I feel. But anyway, that is an academic question now. Now we have to deal with Biden's approach. And that does not seem to be against our interests. Yes, but definitely we will order more arms from Russia. That is very clear because Russia expects us to maintain a balance between our arms from the West and arms from Russia. And uh, it is when we reduce our arms purchases uh, that Russia, uh, you know, kind of shows its uh, um, uh, shows its disappointment. It happens the last time, two, two or three years ago, when Putin was in India, there was some unpleasantness because we had not purchased new arms. And with the S-400, that, that, uh, that complaint has disappeared. And uh, without provoking uh, American action or sanctions, we'll probably remain within the limits of uh, those possibilities. Uh, but S-400, it appears that there will be a waiver for us. That is the indication. That is why the Russians have announced that as 400 missiles have started arriving in India, and by the end of the year, the first batch will be assembled. So, and uh, the Americans have not reacted to that yet. So, we can believe that uh, as 400, there will be no sanctions, and uh, we will uh, continue to purchase arms from Russia. So, there is nothing else. Thank you very much. We'll meet again next week.